Well, th thank you, and uh, thanks for coming back for after the break. And uh, yeah, a quick introduction. I'm Derek Boyas. I'm with AMD. I've been at AMD as a product manager for the GPU compute software stack for the last five and a half years. And so through that time, I've spent uh, uh, looking at uh, PyTorch as one of the main machine learning frameworks. And I'll give a little bit of a history today and uh, some introductions of some in the interesting libraries we've been working on. So as part of AMD, AI is really one of the key pillars. It's uh, important for both the training and inference, you know, on the cloud and edge devices. We, AMD has a wide range of hardware, and we see that AI is becoming so pervasive across the industry. You know, it's, everyone here knows about that based on even the last few months of uh, interest. And really, want to talk about today the different hardware platforms, how, how those are enabled with PyTorch, and then some additional libraries. So first, in the machine learning flow, there's different amounts of compute required for the different components. So in pre-training, it's really intense of large number of servers. You have many GPUs or other accelerators to connect with a large amount of data. The fine tuning, and you've seen all the papers come out recently, there's a lot of uh, ways to reduce the amount of data required. You want to iterate quickly. And then on the inference side, it all comes down to um, latency, the throughput, uh, how fast can you respond and get that answer out. So through all these different uh, use cases, you have different hardware requirements. And with AMD's, it has a large suite of devices, everything from small CPUs to large accelerators. Um, I'm in the data center GPU uh, component group, so uh, the Instinct is the brand of the product. But really, it depends on what your application is. You can't just say, oh, you need to use this device. It comes down to what is the, the workload you're doing, what's the performance, what's the, the power is actually quite important. Again, it depends where you live. Power is uh, rising very quickly. And so if we look at the suite of devices, this helps give a bit of an overview of the branding. And on the left-hand side, the CPUs are called Ryzen and Epic. So Epic is the server CPU, Ryzen is the more client CPU. And Pensando is the um, network processing component. It's a company AMD bought uh, last year. On the accelerator side, we have the Radeon graphics cards. So those are also used for gaming, but they can contain a lot of math accelerators. And then the Instinct is the data center GPU uh, component, which has um, a lot of matrix math operations, high performance compute support for um, running in large uh, systems like the Frontier has a exascale type class system and it doesn't have the graphics components so you can you don't do a lot of uh, graphics modeling or uh, ray tracing. And then and the adaptive computing this is on the Xilinx acquisition so AMD acquired Xilinx last year as well and so there's a bunch of different brands there. Uh, the Zinc is a small ARM-based processor with uh, FPGA logic gates and there's the Vertex and Versal and Kentex, uh, various, work, uh, various devices for your different workloads. And so in the architecture of these devices, so if we start on the left-hand side, on the CPU, it, we call that uh, Zen, so Z-E-N or Z-E-N, depends uh, if you're from Canada. Or um, Then on the accelerator phase, we have in the Radeon side, it's RDNA. And on the instinct side, it's called cDNA. And so that was for Radeon com uh, versus compute as a DNA of the architecture. So they have different properties a little bit in, in terms of how they've been optimized for the hardware. And then on the adaptive computing, it's called xDNA. And so we'll see that as we come through a couple of the other slides. So let's talk a little bit about PyTorch and AMD catching the bus. So um, when we were talking earlier, like when did PyTorch first start? I didn't start in 2016, but in 2017, I was at AMD and we we're looking at all these different um, frameworks that are available there. I think there were seven or eight on my little roadmap and you know, they consolidated, but 
PyTorch has been there for quite a while, so we had this beta in 2017. Um, did some porting of the cafe to HIP Cafe, and HIP is the programming language that's very similar to CUDA. So if you're experienced with CUDA, it looks the same, similar API. And we created a tool to call it Hipify to convert CUDA code to HIP. And that's what we did with CAFE. And this was the first project to sort of to use that tool. And it became part of the compile path. And so then as we, as we worked through this, we kept that tool updated. So as there were new APIs Im implemented, it would automatically convert. And actually, that's still the way it works today, is that the whole code base is still CUDA. And as you compile it, it targets the AMD device with the HIP API calls. But as you can see, in this phase between 2018 and 2021, we were catching the bus. And this is where you know, we spent time on CI. So we set up servers so that people could run pull requests and they would actually run on AMD hardware. And really getting to the point where we could have front page support. And then finally this year, we're, I would say we're at day zero support on a new release. So it's a really great milestone to see because you know, trying to maintain your own fork, it's not a winning battle. So to run code today, it's very straightforward. You, you can either get a container or you can install the Rockham driver and then you just install the pip wheel from pytorch.org. So you go through the little selection box, copy and paste the code in, and you're up and running with the system on our, our hardware. And if you've already written an application using PyTorch, you don't actually have to change any of the code. You, you actually leave where it says device equals CUDA, if torch CUDA, you, you leave that code there, it, it works, and it uses the AMD uh, hardware. So we have support for the nightly builds. Uh, that's where a lot of the development happens. I invite you to check it out there. So a little bit more detail on things that are happening behind the scenes. Um, I mentioned that we are converting the code, so it's using Hipify as the tool. Um, but you can actually still go and find out if the device is a HIP device. And so uh, there's a little bit of code at the bottom there to say is Rock and PyTorch. Check the version.hip. And how we, we do some of this work in the background is with uh, libraries. Of course, there's lots of common math and communication libraries um, that help accelerate the workloads. And these are integrated into either PyTorch and or other projects. Um, some of them are more focused for HPC, but there's a lot that are interesting for the, um, the machine learning space. And Rickle is a collective communication library that actually uses the same API as Nickel. So it actually doesn't do the HIP conversion. It's the same API, and then it's the AMD implementation underneath to connect to our hardware. The composable kernel one is uh, interesting because it creates uh, options for building up your fused kernels. So if you're really spending a lot of time building up your own uh, operators, you can build fused kernels and uh, get very great performance through that. So if you do want to build the PyTorch uh, code base, there's a script included in the repository to do that. Um, and it's pretty straightforward and it works out of the box. And then on the various backend implementations, there's a eager mode. And with the new torch.compile in uh, PyTorch 2.0, um, that, that's available as well. And it uses the OpenAI Triton implementation. And we also have uh, worked with uh, the AI template library. And so there's a composable kernel component that plugs into that. And that's one of the methodologies we've seen give the best performance for inference for the instinct GPUs. And there's a nice blog uh, post, so when you get the slides, you can just click on the link and view all the details there. So that's the side of the Rockham on the instinct or the cDNA and the rDNA type devices. So Next up is the Zen devices. So the, this is the Epic and uh, the other CPU uh, infrastructure devices. 
so ZenDNN is uh, very similar to uh, OneDNN, as you can tell by the diagram. Uh, it, it's mostly used for inference. And we are working towards getting that upstreamed into the main PyTorch repository as well. So it is, looks at the exact um, CPU codes and creates some optimized kernels for our hardware. And then we also mentioned the XDNA. So this is on the um, FPGA side. So there, there's not a, a built-in path in PyTorch, but it can take PyTorch models and convert them and then run uh, an inference workload on most of those devices. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more at the end about how we're merging some of this work all, all together. So in terms of the ecosystem, it's really important to be able to change code and see what's going uh, happening all the way from the application layer down to the device driver. And we've uh, open sourced our full stack. And so you can um, go and actually rebuild the kernel driver if you find you need some tweak or something needs to be modified at that layer. You can tell that there's a few different uh, licenses that are required for the different parts of the stack, and that's really due to the heritage of them. Like the, the GDB uh, debugger is still a, a GPL license because of the history of that. But the advantage is, is that since we're upstreaming that code into GDB, you can use your standard GDB commands to do debugging. And we really wanted to work with the community. So all this code is posted up on GitHub. Um, we're, let's say, it's been a struggle to maintain all the requests, but we're getting better at monitoring the GitHub library components for uh, forum, like input, pull requests, and uh, actually tracking uh, components there. So one of the other uh, interesting uh, tools is the Kinito Profiler. So this uses the core rock prof component, which is rock tracer, as ways to abstract the information from the GPU. And then it plugs right into a tensor board. So you can use the tools that you're familiar with today and get the performance perspective of what's happening in the kernel. You can see the memory, trans, uh, memory uh, changes from the CPU to the GPU or from uh, the different times that the kernel components take. On the ecosystem, there's quite a few libraries, even within PyTorch. Um, and as of the PyTorch 1.12 uh, release, these four core components were all enabled with the Rockham ecosystem. So you have the text classification, some uh, recommender systems, the computer vision libraries, as well as support for audio and signal processing. On the sort of expansion side of working with uh, PyTorch is uh, the Onyx runtime. So we spent a lot of time uh, supporting uh, this infrastructure to uh, have, um, I guess, a good performance with our core libraries but also uh, upstreaming this into the Onyx Runtime project. So for both um, inference and for training, you can get uh, pre-compiled components for the Rockham uh, system. The, the Torch um, ORT is the Python module that you use, and it's pretty straightforward to plug it in. And as you can see through the the architecture of how Onyx runtime is built, it uses the execution provider. And that execution provider is sort of a nice abstraction for the different hardware implementations. And you can see there's quite a few uh, available for different hardware devices in the market. And I've highlighted in purple the ones for AMD. So you have the standard CPU components, you have uh, the MI graphics and the Rockham implementations as well as uh, the Vitus uh, from the Xilinx uh, 
FPGA support. So then we, another interesting project is DeepSpeed. So this gives you some uh, great support for running those large language models on a reduced number of GPUs. So you have uh, ways to um, use a better memory optimization. You, you can offload to CPU, or you can even offload into uh, disk. And so there's a couple uh, links there for getting the upstream components or prepackaged uh, binaries. Then this is a topic I, I find pretty interesting that's happening in this space is the concept of uh, intermediate representation and working through these different layers to figure out, okay, how can you make the hardware abstracted but still get very efficient kernels? And it, it's usually the way, like, as you abstract more, you get less efficiency. So there's always this trade-off between building pre-compiled libraries or doing something on the fly or working at, at, at a very high level of the framework. Um, so we've been doing some work with uh, Triton. The IR there, as I mentioned, with PyTorch Compile. Um, but the OpenXLA with stable HLO and the IREE, it's, uh, it's also another methodology of using MLIR to reduce those calls into a, a nice abstraction for hardware and then have um, that hardware support for different devices. What this allows you to do is jet create kernels for new hardware very quickly um, or a different architecture. It may not be the best performance, but it gives you that portability. And speaking of performance, uh, with PyTorch 2, uh, we did a quick study on some of the core benchmarks included in there with uh, the Hugging Face models. And this shows a, a, a nice boost in performance from on average about 1.5 times the performance going from PyTorch Eager to the PyTorch uh, compile mode. Um, some showing much higher performance, and again, it depends on the kernels, it depends on the model, and then the kernels that get generated. And, and I see this improving over time as well as people become more aware of how to build th uh, those with MLIR. And so, for long term, this is where AMD is looking to put all of our hardware platforms together under one roof, specifically for inference. We call it unified inference front end. And it's available today, and we keep adding more devices under this structure. We also plan to, um, well, it's, it's available through the uh, inference server. So if you are running it, um, something that you have a whole suite of models already developed and deployed. Um, you can run an inference server, it's standard type of uh, JSON interface with uh, an API that you can get the components and run it on the different devices. Uh, we have pre-trained and then pre-optimized uh, models for all the different hardware platforms, and we'll expand that over time. Uh, and this is supporting many different frameworks, but as you can see, there's sort of three core stacks for the three types of hardware architectures. And we also are looking at how we can optimize that so it's just less effort to migrate from one device to another. And uh, yeah, and that, that's all I had for today. So open for questions. Okay. I don't think any of it's intrinsic. It's more just um, looking at it to expose hardware features. So one that we've spent time on is in the hardware we have uh, matrix math operations and making sure that the upper layers can see that those exist and know that they can generate code that will then make use of them. So it's all about exposing it to the right layer and then making sure that those layers can create the code that's optimized. So I, I don't see anything limiting, it's just a case of um, 
yeah, them spending time on the, on the intermediate layer. Any other questions? Has anyone used an AMD hardware device? Oh, I got a few. Nice. Um, maybe, maybe a shout out to the hug, hugging face side of things too. Is that I, I know uh, we have a lot of people have tried just the standard like any model that's there on PyTorch, and they've actually just run it out of the box. So, you know, it just as a testament of the whole ecosystem is working. It's nice to see. So, and and if you don't, if you find something that doesn't work, file a bug and let us know. Great. Well, thank you for your time.